It is great to be with you again as we work through our, the book of Isaiah, our series in Isaiah. Today, as we work through the book of Isaiah, we are in chapter 7 and 8. So if, uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, there's a Bible in the rack in front of you that looks like this. And you can fi find Isaiah 7 on page 571. Page 571. Also want you to know, if you don't have a Bible, we would love for you to take this Bible home with you. There's even a note in the front that says, take this Bible home with you, so you know you're allowed to do it. So you're welcome to one of these if you don't have a Bible. Um, as we're working through Isaiah, um, there's, as I read it out loud, you'll notice sometimes L-O-R-D is in all caps, even occasionally God is in all caps, and that is the covenant name of God, Yahweh. So when we read it here, we say Yahweh, even though the, the text itself has either God or Lord. There's a long explanation for that, but I won't give it to you now. But know that's why we're doing that. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? Isaiah chapter 7 and 8. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And Yahweh said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jeshub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, and say to him, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands, with the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramalia. Because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia has devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord Yahweh. It shall not stand and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Again, Yahweh spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of Yahweh your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put Yahweh to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. Yahweh will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not been since the days that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. In that day, Yahweh will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria, and they will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and in all the pastures. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep away the beard also. In that day, 
A man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep, and because of the abundance of milk that they give, he'll eat curds. For everyone who's left in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines with a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrows, a man will come there, for all the land will be briars and thorns. And as for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns, but they'll become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread. Then Yahweh said to me, Take a large tablet and write on it in common characters, Belonging to Maher Shalal Hashbaz. And I will get reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah, to attest for me. And I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then Yahweh said to me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz. For before the boy knows how to cry, My father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. Yahweh spoke to me again. Because this people has refused the waters of Shaloah that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Ramalia, therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria in all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks and it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck and its outspread wings will fill all the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. For Yahweh spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. For Yahweh of hosts, him you shall Honor is holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he'll become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for Yahweh, who's hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom Yahweh has given me are signs and portents in Israel from Yahweh of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not uh, people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? to the teaching and to the testimony. If they'll not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they're hungry, they'll be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they'll look to the earth. But behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and be thrust into thick darkness. This is God's word. God. You can be seated as we pray. Father, together we unite our prayers before you, asking for your Holy Spirit to work powerfully through your word to shape us and change us in the very ways you intend. We hear so many voices. We need to be able to hear your voice. Would you encourage us and strengthen us today? We together pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
My goal this morning is not to convince you to believe in God. Not the least of which is because even demons believe in God. My goal is not to convince you to believe in God this morning because, importantly, the passage before you does not, and before us does not have its goal to convince us to believe in God. After all, people like Pika and Ahaz believe in God and they are not held up as positive examples here. Rather, this passage is challenging us to pursue a certain kind of belief in God. How is it that we believe in God? What does it look like to believe in God in a way that actually is good for us? That actually orients us rightly to our creator? That actually is honoring to God, our creator? So that is what we need to be thinking about today is what kind of belief we need. And it's, it's important to think about this question. Right belief in God is important at all times, but it's particularly important in some ways in turbulent times when the metal of our faith, our belief, is particularly tested. Turbulent times like the times in which Isaiah was prophesying and as we'll see that King Ahaz was dealing with. Turbulent times like when a war between major world powers breaks out and leaves us feeling unsteady. Turbulent times when there is yet another mass shooting that unsettles our hearts, weighs them with grief. So we need to hear the kind of faith that Isaiah is pleading with us to have in turbulent times. Our passage has two main sections, chapter 7 and chapter 8. Isn't that easy? Chapter 7 gives us two different kings. And chapter 8 asks, which king will you follow? So let's look at chapter 7, two different kings. Now, we get a bit of history here. Isaiah fills us in a little bit. But he, he knows that the people he's writing to have more of the history because they've just lived it. It's recorded for us in the Bible in 2 Kings 16. So this history is accessible to us as well. So I'm going to fill, fill in the picture a little bit here. But basically what you have happening is there's this, there's this king in the, in the southern kingdom of Israel, Judah, and the king's name is Ahaz. And when our story starts, he's, so to speak, in the situation room. Things are bad. He's gathering his advisors saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Let's hatch a plan. Why are things bad? Well... After the long, stable reign of King Uzziah, Uzziah, Uzziah dies, and the Assyrian Empire to the north is starting to flex its muscles, and it's wanting to crush through the northern kingdom, Ephraim, the southern kingdom, Judah, and come plummeting through these kingdoms to get to Egypt and to show its might by taking on Egypt, and they're becoming more and more aggressive. So the northern kingdom with its king Pekka, or Pika, and another nearby nation, Syria, with their king, Rezin, say, we got to form an alliance to fight Assyria. So they form this alliance, the anti-Assyrian alliance, and they expect King Ahaz to join them in fighting the superpower. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Situation room. Is it worth allying with them? Who will ultimately win? And Ahaz decides, 
we will not join the alliance. Well, Pika and Rezin don't think that's such a good idea. They think they might be able to enter in with their two armies into Judah and rattle the saber a little bit and give them some friendly convincing that they should join the alliance. And if they're not willing to, depose King Ahaz and set in their puppet king who can then lead Judah to form this strong alliance that might have a chance against the Assyrians. Now, that's, that's a hard circumstance. Ahaz is in a bind. You can imagine how hard it is as he gathers in his situation room and considers his options. So these two foreign kings in the land attacking while the Assyrian threat is looming and King Ahaz and the people are shaking like the trees were shaking in the windstorm, the derecho we had a week ago. Now, the Lord God, Yahweh, he has an interest in all the affairs of man. He cares about the rise and fall of kings. He's sovereign over those things. But he has a particular interest in this situation. And there's a reason, and we're, we're given a sense of the reason for it in verse 2 when... Judah is referred to as the house of David. This phrase, house of David, is only used three times in the book of Isaiah, and two of the times are in this chapter, verse 2, and then again, uh, I think it's verse 8. Nope. It's in verse 13. House of David, twice. That's important because if you know the Bible... You know that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, Yahweh himself, the covenant-keeping God, makes a covenant with King David and says, all the things that I'm promising to do to fix this world and its brokenness, to deal with the rebellion of mankind against me, all that I'm trying to do to establish my kingdom is going to be done through you. Your son, one of your sons, one of your offspring will reign, reign forever and bring the peace that I promise. And so Israel goes along. This is the promise to King David, the promise of God. And not too long after David dies, the, the northern tribes of Israel say, we don't want to follow Yahweh's king. We don't want to follow the house of David. We're going to establish our own king, Pekah. Well, it's not, not initially Pekah, but by this time it's Pekah. You'll notice our passage barely, it always, the son of Ramalia, the son of Ramalia, he doesn't even want to name his name because he's rebelled against the house of David. And now this group that's rebelled against the house of David is doubting God's promises to preserve this nation. And they're trying to handle things in their own strength and they're coming, waging war against the house of David. God has an interest in this. In a unique way, because the covenant-keeping God has bound himself to David. And so, God says to his prophet, Isaiah, you need to go give a message to King Ahaz. And by the way, take with you your son, whose name is Shir Jashub. Now, that's Hebrew. If you were just translate the name, it means a remnant's returning. You might be a prophet if you name your son remnant returning. And Isaiah has named his son that. So he and old remnant returning go down to meet Ahab as he's kind of inspecting the water supply, making sure things are in good order. And he says key message running all the way from four to nine but it starts in verse four and where it starts and ends gives us a real sense of it he says 
Be careful, be quiet. Do not fear. And do not let your heart be faint before these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. Actually, this do not fear is going to return as a theme again at the end of chapter 8, bookending our whole passage, telling us how important that theme is. So if it, verse 4 begins, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and then verse 9 ends, if you are not firm in the faith, you will not be firm at all. Don't be afraid. Instead, be firm in the faith. And in between, Isaiah merely says, look, even within 65 years, these two nations that have risen against you are going to be wiped out by me. They're not going to stand. They won't make it. So, Ahaz, are you going to trust me? I said this passage is not just about believing in God, but calling us to a certain kind of belief in God. Ahaz in his situation room has a decision to make. Is he going to trust God's prophet? Trust God's promises? Promises that go all the way back to the promise made to Eve and then the promise made to Abraham and then the promise made to David. And now being reiterated here through the prophet Isaiah, or is he going to fear? I think some of us can feel sometimes like we're in the situation room. could be some of those big geopolitical things that I just mentioned, or it could be something much more personal in your own life that other people don't know about. But I'm in the situation room, and I don't know what to do. And it's in these times that we have to ask, where is our faith? What, what, what kind of faith in God do we have? We look to his promises, look to his word and trust that. Or are we going to grab for anything else? And Ahaz is in that situation. King Ahaz. How will he lead the people? But Yahweh doesn't stop there. He offers in his grace powerful sign that will affirm to Ahaz that the very things God has said he will do, he will do. He says, ask for as deep as Sheol, as high as the heaven. Ask for something grand. And Ahaz's response, face value, it looks real pious. I will not ask, verse 12. I will not put Yahweh to the test. He echoes language, that scriptural language. It goes all the way back to Numbers chapter 14 when Israel was in the wilderness, and God had been taking care of wilderness, but they're taking care of Israel in the wilderness, but they're grumbling and complaining against God. They're saying, do something else for us. We want you to do this. They, they treat God like a trick pony. Come and do this trick for us, and, and if you do it, we'll give you the sugar cube of our worship until he's done the trick, and then they're back grumbling again until he does the trick again. So many of us treat God like this, right? He's my trick pony. When I am in a mess and grumbling a little bit, I can reach out for him and say, okay, here we go, show him the trick, do what I need, eat the sugar cube, and back I go again to living my life. And this kind of God as a lucky rabbit's foot religion is disgusting to the scriptures. And God says repeatedly, in this way, do not put Yahweh to the test. And so Ahaz is saying, I don't want to put Yahweh to the test. But as we know from the rest of the story, filled in by 2 Kings 16, but also by Isaiah's very response to it, this is not a sign of great faith. There is a devilish irony in Ahaz using such a phrase. 
If you want to take a class on how to appear pious and religious and yet actually turn your back on God, this is the place to take the class. Because what's going on with Ahaz behind the scenes is in the situation room, they've already decided what they're going to do. They're going to appeal to the Assyrians. Pay them off with gold and silver from Yahweh's temple to come and defend them against Ephraim and Syria. The lot's already been cast. When Ahaz says, I don't want to put Yahweh to the test, it's not because he has such a big view of God that says, I don't want to use him as my trick pony. No, it's because he's already turned his back on God and is chasing after all sorts of other human, man-made means that seem more real and more tangible to protect him instead of trusting in God and what he provides. King Ahaz's belief in God is not one to be imitated because it's a shallow belief that gives lip service. But when the times are tough, what I'm ultimately grabbing onto the stuff of this world, alliances, this family member, my money. And so, and so the prophet Isaiah tells him in verse 13, here then, here's the phrase again, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? It's clear what Ahaz has done. Therefore, Yahweh himself is going to give a sign. And the signs there in verses 14 and 15, it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He'll eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. This is what God's going to do. The house of David that is itself not trusting the covenant given to David is being judged. And a new new king, a new king from David is going to come and he's going to be born of a virgin and he's going to be named Emmanuel. Because this house of David is not showing the kind of faith in those promises that is needed for God's people. Another one is coming, a powerful sign, Emmanuel, God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. Now at this point, I should point out that this verse is one that is under attack. There are some anti-miracle linguists who have led a war on the word virgin there saying all it means is like a young maiden. There's another word if they're trying to say someone who's not known a man that'd be used. There's a couple problems with this. Number one is God's like, ask the biggest sign you want. Oh, you don't, you don't want I'll give an even bigger one a young lady's gonna have a baby (laughs) shocking it's not an old lady it's not a sign if it's just a young lady having a baby but also there the agenda that they're bringing biases how they think about things there's actually I'm not the expert in Hebrew either but as I've read and researched there's, there's two words that both can kind of be used in a situation like this. Neither one means not known a man. One focuses more on their age, being young, and the other one focuses more on their marital status, not knowing or not being married. And it's this second word that would be the more natural one to use because if you're young and married versus not being married, right? And so Isaiah chooses the word that focuses on not being married and the implication then is 
she's not known a man. So virgin is the right translation here. Now you say, okay, James, we're, we're tracking with you. You say, hey, the great sign that Yahweh's going to bring in light of Ahaz's rejection of those promises is that there's, there's going to be a virgin who bears a son and his name is going to be called Emmanuel, which means God's with us. But you said it's a new king from the line of David. Why did you say that? That's not here in the passage to which I'd respond to you. This is one of those Isaianic clues that I've been talking about. Remember how Isaiah likes to put a little clue that doesn't have all the information that kind of piques our curiosity. What is he talking about here? And then later on in his prophecy, he builds into that and gives more and more hints and fills out the picture. That's what's going on with here with the idea of Emmanuel. Emmanuel is only used two times here in Isaiah. And the other time it's used is in chapter 8. Look at the end of verse 8, where it talks about the land of Judah, and it refers to it as your land, O Emmanuel. Not Ahaz's land, but Emmanuel's land. The, the ultimate king ruler over Judah is this Emmanuel. The picture gets filled out even further in chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. Stephen Jones is going to be preaching on this passage next week. It's a famous Christmas passage about how light's going to come into this world in the midst of darkness. A king is going to come who will bring peace and justice and righteousness. And this king is called Almighty God. And he's also from the house of David. Well, that must be this Emmanuel that's being spoken of. So even in just the span of a chapter and a half, we get filled out who this Emmanuel is. And so I've spoiled the Isianic clue for you a little bit. But that's why I say what God's doing here isn't just, oh, by the way, there's going to be a random sign that I'm big. No, he's saying, Ahaz, it's not you anymore. It's Emmanuel. He'll be born of a virgin. That's a powerful sign. Verse 15 talks about how he eat curds and honey you can often, you know, you read that, you think, oh, that sounds like you'll have a luxurious life until you read just a little bit further down in verse 22 when it's describing a, a land that's been ravaged where all they have left is just a few milk cows and sheep that produce, and there in that land they're eating curds and honey. So this is actually a reference to an Emmanuel who'll be born in kind of a backwater Bethlehem and go through life with very little. So that's the great sign. Two kings, Ahaz and Emmanuel. Now verses 16 to the end, so through 25, are, are a little tricky. They're a little confusing. And what they're stating, it's pretty straightforward. It's a, it's a reiteration of what was said in verses 8 and 9. It's just saying, look, I, Yahweh, am going to bring a mighty defeat of Ephraim and Syria. They're going down. She's evocative, powerful language to describe the kind of defeat he's going to bring upon them. But the trick is it seems like as it's told that these events are going to happen concurrently with Emmanuel's life. Now, the, the, the way English verbal tenses work is a little different than Hebrew verbal tenses, and there's a little bit more ambiguity in the way Hebrew verbal tenses work, but I think even trying to argue that way to say this is clearly pointing to Jesus misses the point a little bit because when you read prophets in the scriptures, they routinely, this, this is what they do, they take the current event, the current situation they're dealing with, start talking about it, and then they like to recast it against the backdrop of the big things God's doing ultimately in the world. So they recast it with cosmic proportions, and then they bring it back down and apply it to those people then. 
So you see prophets doing this all the time. They start talking about a, a near situation, and all of a sudden they're talking about God's great plan for the world, and, and then they're back talking about the current situation again. And it, I don't know if you've ever driven with somebody, not a lot of stick shift drivers anymore, manual transmissions, but you know, when I drive, it's like, mm, mm, someone real smooth on the clutch. You, just, you don't even notice when you're shifting. That's how these prophets move between what they're talking about in their current situation and the bigger things that God's doing. So... Let me just kind of give you an example to, uh, of how this might work. L- let's say I, 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 said, I said to you this. I'm a prophet. I'm speaking to you. And I said, put not your hope in blue signs or red signs. Don't even trust the orange or yellow signs. Green is not the color we need in government. Rather, what we need is a sign that will rend the heavens and fill the skies at the trumpet blast. That is the one hope that we could have for governing in a just and right way. And so as you think of your voting this Thursday, remember, of course, the great sign that will render the skies and place your hope there. You know what I'm doing. Now, someone could scrutinize it and say, I think he's speaking chronologically, and I think he's saying Jesus will return before Thursday. (laughs) That's not what I was doing at all. That's how the prophets work. That's what they do. And so he starts talking about Emmanuel, and all of a sudden he's like, okay, remember, in this small way, God is going to bring a victory. But these small victories in this time that are fulfilling his covenant to this people are a sign. They're they're just a taste of the bigger victory that's coming because of Emmanuel. And so they move back and forth between those things with some freedom uh, smooth on the clutch. So all the victories of God are ultimately because of this King Emmanuel that's coming, even if he is yet to come. So we have before us Two kings. One, two kings here before you. That's what I said now. Apology to the spin doctors there. That brings us to chapter eight, where we have a choice. Which king will we follow? Which king will we follow? Yahweh gives the prophet Isaiah a task. He's to make a big sign that says, Mahar or Maher Shalal Hashbaz. I had to practice saying that. That means, in Hebrew, if you're translating it, it means the spoil will spread and the prey will hasten. Make a big sign. Okay, so Isaiah makes the big sign. Why is he making this sign? Well, all of a sudden, the prophet and his wife get pregnant. And Yahweh's like, now you know, because I actually want you to name your son Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Rod is rising, you'll be eaten. I mean, these poor kids. (laughs) Now, the older brother's the one with the cute name. Remnant rising, or a remnant will return, right? But I'm stuck with, rot is rising, you'll be eaten. It's not as optimistic either. And then the prophet Isaiah is told why there's this son with this name. And it begins really reiterating just what was said in chapter 8, or chapter 7, that Ephraim and Syria are going to lose Now it says instead of just within 65 years, it's like actually it's happening real soon before this baby even can say mama, daddy. It's going to happen. But now, now we see that Isaiah's turned his attention from the two kings to the people themselves. Because picking up in verse 5, he likens the situation to two rivers. One is kind of a 
gentle, flowing, tender, nondescript, seemingly unimportant river where the people of Judah are welcome to come and take comfort in this gentle, lowly river. Clearly referring to God and his promises where you have to wait, you have to trust, where Emmanuel come eating curds and honey, gentle, seemingly unimportant. Or we can trust this big, mighty river, the Assyrians. That's what King Ahaz has told us to do. So who are we going to follow? Who are we going to side with? Are we going to trust the promises of God and this gentle, nondescript river? Or are we going to go for the mighty river? Well, you know exactly what the people did. Those same people who are quaking with King Ahaz decide to follow King Ahaz And they go and chase this big river. He's like, you know what's going to happen with this big river? Sure, it's going to come. The Syrians are going to come, and they're going to wipe out the the northern tribes. They're going to wipe out Syria. But you know what's going to happen? Surprise, it's going to overflow its banks and sweep into the land of Judah, your land. And it's going to come all the way up so you're barely struggling to keep your head above water. Now, it's interesting. This is exactly what would happen historically. The Assyrians would sweep in. They would take the northern kingdom to exile, and then they would invade Judah, and they'd get right up to the walls of Jerusalem, about to sack it when God would intervene and send them back to their land. And the southern tribes would last for another 140 years before the Babylonians take them into exile. And then... In verses 19, or sorry, 9 to 22, Isaiah then pleads with people. Okay, I know what the, the, the vast majority of you have done. You've sided with Ahaz. But will you turn from the way of Ahaz and trust the new king, Emmanuel? We know that's what he's about because right at the very start in verses 9 and 10, he, he makes this proclamation to the nations. He's like, go do what you want. Put on your armor. You'll be shattered. Why at the end of verse 10? For God is with us. That's what Emmanuel means. God with us. I'm with Emmanuel. I'm trusting God's promises for this virgin-born king that will rescue us. And because I'm with Emmanuel, because God is with us, I'm not afraid in the face of these nations. And then he says in verse 12, don't call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. You know, today we think of conspiracy like it's kind of a hot button word. And we think of conspiracies like, you know, they involve Bill Gates and the moon and aliens and I don't know, things like that, right? Easy to write off. But that's not what conspiracy is getting after here. The idea here is you're in a pickle, and you're hearing all sorts of things. These people are conspiring together against Ahaz. These people are conspiring together against the Assyrians, and, you know, it's in their feet. It's popping up, and, oh, that gives me panic. Oh, that gives me panic. I open up to turn the news. Oh, that gives me panic. I go to work, and I talk. Oh, that gives me panic. That's what's going on. Every little conspiracy of man, all the things they're conspiring together to do. And I says, don't fear that. Don't get caught up in that. What's the solution? Verse 13. But Yahweh of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. In other words, behold the Holy One of Israel. When you're able to see the one who alone stands separate and powerful and glorious over all the earth as king, like Isaiah saw him in chapter 6. When you really tremble and say, woe is me, for I am undone. 
That's the cure to all the other things that cause us panic and fear. Uh, one of the pastors I love to read, uh, his name is Dale Ralph Davis, and he has a, a short commentary on, on this part of Isaiah. And he says this about the dread of Yahweh. He says, as soon as a text says something like this, someone speaks up and qualifies it with, now that doesn't mean fear in the sense of terror. Why not? How do they know that? What are we to assume it means when we're told Yahweh is to be our dread? Why are we so concerned to make Yahweh nothing but a mild-mannered church keeper? Why shouldn't we tremble before this God? If there's nothing else Isaiah does for us, the book of Isaiah is to see God in all his glory and his holiness and to see we're undone before him. Like Isaiah. Because then when we realize I'm a sinner, I'm broken, I'm small, I'm weak, we repent and we find his grace in Emmanuel, in Jesus. The tongs of the hot coal touch our lips. We're made whole. And we want to serve him. You see, when we, when we fear Yahweh, what happens? Verse 14, he will become a sanctuary. Now, verse 14 goes on because those who don't fear him end up, where do they end up? Snared, taken, fallen, broken. So the logic works like this. On the one hand, you can fear Yahweh, tremble before him. When you do, the very thing you fear becomes your sanctuary and you're safe from all the other fears of this world. Or you can fear everything else. And those fears only intensify. They cause us to be psychotic. They get into our brain and consume us. We're paranoid. We're paralyzed. And then we don't have Yahweh as our refuge. He actually has to set himself against us in his justice. The one fear that cures all other fears, the one fear we must have in our life is the fear of Yahweh. And then Isaiah pushes harder. He tells the disciples, so let us bind up his testimony and his word. Let us put it in our hearts so that we can say, all right, I'm trusting your promises. I'm, I'm, I'm sealing up inside me. And I'm going to wait, and I'm going to trust, and I'm going to hope. Verses 16 and 17. I love verse 18. He always like, or Isaiah's like, I had to name my kids. Remnant is returning. Rot rising, you'll be eaten. Do you not get the point? <laughs> These are portents and signs. God is going to raise a remnant, but there's also judgment coming. So where are you going to stand? Who are you going to fear? You know, clinging to the testimony is clinging to God's word is important because we trust God's promises and we hope in what he's doing. But it's also important because our nature is to try and find something to hold on to. What's true? How, do I, how am I supposed to think about this? How am I supposed to walk through this circumstance? How am I supposed to survive this? How am I supposed to get through today with the challenges it faces? And we're always looking for voices, authoritative voices. It could come in the form of necromancers who are you know, trying to connect us with the spiritual world that's out there. It could come in the form of mediums who are trying to tap into spiritual forces to give us guidance. You have know, fortune tellers, astrologists, these kind of things. But it also can come in other forms like some spiritual guru, some wise sage in the world, some best-selling author, some hot podcast, some fired faculty member willing to say the hard things. and you know, we, we turn to all these things, an inner voice, 
our intuition. Read the circumstances. And Isaiah's like, stop it. That's chirping. It's muttering. It's not any good to you. To the word. To the testimony. Look to what God has said to be your guidance. If you do, you have light and you have hope. You're able to stand. Because you're with Emmanuel, God with us. If you don't, you're just going to take in, you're going to Darkness sets in, gloom, despair. Maybe you occasionally will lift up your hand and say, God, why are you doing this to me? And then you go about still being hungry. No dawn, all darkness, gloom, anguish. See how Isaiah is pleading with us not just to believe in God, but a certain kind of belief. What kind of belief? A belief that actually fears God and not man. A belief that as a result trusts his word and treasures it. One, to give us hope. He will keep his promises. He'll do what he says he'll do. And two, to give us guidance instead of the chirping and muttering. We fear God. We look to his word. And then we follow the right king. We don't stand with Ahaz. Instead, we run to Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, God who took on the flesh, was born of a virgin to fulfill the sign. Live that poverty life, just like was said, so that he could bring about the ultimate day of the Lord where he would go to a cross and take our rebellion and our sin and all the, all the justice we deserve for that upon himself. And make us into a new people who are his, forgiven, restored to a relationship with our creator. We follow that king. That's the kind of faith that Isaiah is pleading with us to have. That's the kind of faith that will actually hold us in troubling times. Let's pray. God, may we be people who fear you and therefore who stand on your promises that cannot fail no matter what assails us. Amen.